Hey guys, uh, sorry I'm getting this out so late. It's It's been kind of a, a busy week. I actually had to be at school to help with some stuff, so I hadn't gotten um, time to do my videos in between everything else. So uh, the only thing that I didn't finish yesterday when I was trying to wrap up on Vietnam um, was the last couple of slides that are on um, the second page of notes for Vietnam. So I'm going to wrap up that. I'm going to intro into 60s culture and then let that be the rest of what we talk about tomorrow. Um, and then we might talk a little bit of 70s and um, and Nixon on Friday, finish next week, and then squeeze in what we can of the 80s. That's probably as far as we're going to be able to get. Uh, so what I didn't finish yesterday um, on the rest of your Vietnam slides was talking about um, when Nixon wins the 1968 election, uh, one of the biggest things on his plate is trying to figure out how are we going to get out of, of Vietnam? I mean, that's, that's the big question. Um, and a lot of people, I think, assume that he's going to be able to come in uh, and get us out, you know? Uh, six months, a year, we're done, we're out, right? Uh, that is not the case. We end up being in a lot longer. So Nixon wins. Um, what he does say, um, he tries to be kind of vague about it. He doesn't want to make empty promises. Nobody wants that, right? Um, so what he says is he promises peace with honor. And what he essentially means by that is um, he's going to try and get the United States out of Vietnam without embarrassing ourselves too bad, without making it be obvious to everyone in the world that we probably shouldn't have gotten involved in Vietnam to begin with. You know, um, you know, we we tend to think of ourselves as the United States as kind of the big dogs, and we don't want to embarrass ourselves in front of um, in front of other countries. Um, especially we don't want to make it look bad like we were wrong in front of our enemies, right? So he comes up with the idea of peace with honor, that we're going to try and get out of this thing as dignified as possible. And it's almost like, you know, we don't want to go home like a, a dog who's in trouble with like their tail tucked between their legs because you know they've done something wrong, right? So we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to get out of this. Uh, and everybody say, like, told you so, should have been in it to begin with. So we call, uh, we start a process that we call Vietnamization to where um, Nixon starts having uh, troops slowly withdraw. Um, our numbers have gotten a lot higher than what we had ever anticipated actually sending over. And so the idea was to train the South Vietnamese soldiers to be able to defend themselves so that we could slowly withdraw our troops uh, and then just eventually be out of it. Um, we start to heavily bomb Laos and Cambodia, and you're like, why? why? Why are they involved? But don't forget, that's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail is. That's where the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese have been sneaking into South Vietnam uh, and been able to attack and use guerrilla warfare against our soldiers. So um, we are trying to use the strategy of a war of attrition to where, and it might have been a while since even the Civil War, since you've talked about a war of attrition, but the idea is to wage total war to try and take away all their supply lines, all their supplies, uh, pretty much kill their their ability to, to wage war, essentially. If they have no supplies, if they have no help, and they can't keep fighting. Uh, so we're, we're bombing Laos and Cambodia, neighboring countries. Again, a lot of people are really upset about this because this is dragging more and more countries into the war, and we are not trying to create a World War III situation. That The more countries we drag into this, the bigger this thing is going to get. Um, Nixon, again, wants to leave this war without admitting we were wrong to be in it to begin with. Uh, and more things go wrong than go right. We have, like, we need anything else to go bad in 68, right? Like I told you, 68 is like one of the worst years in American history. We have more violence, more bloodshed, we're at war, we got assassinations, 
We got the civil rights uh, violence that's happening. And we got the protesting. We got everything, right? Uh, the Malau Massacre also happens in 1968 to where an American platoon is in South Vietnam searching for the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. They round up a village. They end up shooting and killing um, over a hundred men, women, and children. Uh, and obviously that kind of goes against one of our big rules of war that we don't kill women and children uh, and not supposed to target civilians. And so as soon as that hits the news, and I told you this is a televised war, so the public finds out about it. And so we are devastated at the fact that American soldiers are killing men, women, and children, uh, burning and destroying whole villages. I mean, this is not what we signed up for. This is not what we thought was coming. And so it's devastating news. And of course, this is one of many reasons why when our soldiers come home from Vietnam that they have so many horrible, awful nicknames they're given. They're called baby killers among other things, because of incidences like Mai Lao. Um, now, there's a lot of factors that you have to think about in this. Um, one of those is the fact that we are waging a war against um, a different culture. And I told you before that Asian cultures tend to be willing to literally sacrifice themselves, their, their family, men, women, and children, doesn't really matter, sacrifice anybody and everybody, whoever it takes, uh, in honor and glory for their country, um, you know, and that is something that, you know, we don't, we don't encourage that, we don't practice that, you know, we don't strap bombs to our own children in the name of war, you know, that's just not something that we do, we do not see cultural value in that, and, so it's really hard. It is a lot more of a mental and emotional war as much as it is a physical war for our soldiers. And a lot of them have a really hard time coping with that. And some of them, uh, to cope with this, get heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol while overseas, which doesn't help when they come back home because now they're addicted, they're suffering from PTSD, uh, and now they're getting called horrible names because of what they were told to do while overseas. Uh, we know that protesting is happening everywhere. Um, again, things get worse before it gets better. Kent State University uh, in Ohio, May of 1970, National Guard shoots into the crowd of protesters. All right, so the students were wrong in that they burned down an ROTC building which, number one, is government property. Uh, number two, they're committing arson. Uh, so they were wrong in doing that. But what happened afterwards is, is worse. Because, excuse me, we have the National Guard that comes in to restore order. They end up shooting into the crowd. They kill, mm, hold on, injure nine, kill four. But can you imagine what Americans' reaction is going to be when they see on the front page of the newspaper that four college students have been killed and their pictures are plastered all over media, newspapers, TV, and that's not the only place that um, incidences go down. Jackson State University is another one. Uh, so we just feel like we are being bombarded with awful news, violence, um, you know, this whole back and forth between the Hawks versus Doves over the Vietnam War. Uh, the Pentagon Papers end up being leaked. So we, we f officially find out that the U.S. government has been misleading us on how the war's going, on how long it will take for us to wrap this war up. And of course, you know, we feel really frustrated that we feel like we've been lied to. And nobody likes to be uh, lied to. So of course... Uh, people start to lose trust in the government. People start to lose trust in, um, in the government officials. It's not a good situation. So these papers get leaked uh, to the public. So we now know kind of what people have thought in the back of their minds but weren't sure about. You know, sometimes we play it off saying, oh, the media is just trying to hype this up. You know, well, now we know 
for a fact that things are not going the way that we're being told um, and things are getting worse instead of better. So unfortunately, the war in Vietnam ends uh, early 1973. We got into all this officially in 65. So almost 10 years, you know. Um, so U.S. troops finish uh, coming out in 1973. The Paris peace talks start up. And um, less than two years later, Saigon, what was the capital of South Vietnam, falls to communism. And if you can imagine, that feels like a, a gut punch to the American people, that we feel like a war that we weren't really totally sure about has now all been for nothing. Think about, you know, that eight and a half years of blood, sweat, tears, money, supplies, uh, loved ones that have been lost, you know, the wounded, uh, you know, think about all that. You've got about 58,000 Americans that are killed, uh, over 300,000 that come home wounded. Um, and to think that if we had just made the decision not to get involved in the first place, uh, think about what we could have saved. So, um, people are really upset, you know, that was a total waste of time, money, resources, uh, American lives, uh, veterans are being treated a lot differently when they come home, they're not treated as heroes, you know, they're being blamed for the war, but it wasn't even their fault, you know, uh, and it doesn't matter if they were drafted or volunteered, they were doing what their country uh, had asked them to do, and, and they're not getting the thanks and recognition that previous veterans had, and that's really devastating. Uh, and that has a lot to do with why a lot of uh, veterans from Vietnam don't want to talk about it. You know, they literally feel like they've been to hell and back, and they don't want to talk about their experiences. You know, they don't feel like heroes. They weren't treated like heroes. Uh, a lot of them, when they came home, were not only called horrible names, but were spit at, had trash thrown at them. Uh, so it's a horrible situation. We do know that it, it, silver lining, if some good is coming out of this, we know the 26th Amendment has passed. We uh, lower the voting age to 18. You know, if you're old enough to be drafted, you're old enough to be able to vote for the people that make that decision for you. Uh, we have the War Powers Act that comes out of this that limits the president's power on when and how long he can send troops. Uh, the president only has 90 days. As, as commander-in-chief, he is over the armed forces, but it limits him, saying that he only has 90 days, uh, you know, to be able to send troops out, and in that time period, Congress makes the decision as to whether the, stu the, the troops stay or come back. So, limiting his, his uh, power over the military, um, we are allowing Vietnamese refugees to come into the United States, uh, especially when Saigon, Saigon falls. Uh, and we do erect a beautiful memorial uh, that is established in 1982 uh, to recognize the uh, Vietnam soldiers that had been lost uh, and the various units that fought during the Vietnam War. So, all right, that is it. Uh, after this, I get into um, 60s culture, and I'll just wait and do that tomorrow. All right, I'm going to stop there.